Rockstar has spent the majority of its time in the gaming industry as a magnet for ridicule, rebelliously flaunting its masterful satire and graphic content in the face of controversy. After creating a murderous snuff film simulator, Manhunt, and GTA, a series whose existence thrives off of criticism like a parasite, they combine their propensity to interlace film references into their games with their inherent ability to display violence in a manner that challenges the status quo and said, why not make a gang simulator. Now, we can't talk about the game without mentioning the movie it's based on. Rockstar couldn't have picked a more fitting film to recreate. Like Rockstar, the makers of The Warriors went to great lengths to bring a sense of authenticity to their rendition of Saul Urich's 1965 novel, The Warriors, which derived from Greek soldier and writer Xenophon's work called Anabasis. Now, I hope I'm not slaughtering that. It's a tale of Cyrus's journey to lead an army of Greek mercenaries to overthrow his brother, only to fall during battle leaving Xenophon responsible to lead the retreating army from inland to the coast back home. The spiel is, a meeting is organized by the Rifts, some bad mamma jammas to unify the gangs of New York. You swore this was a battle between warriors. Over 100 gangs of nine delegates flood Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx, where the warriors are framed by Luther, the leader of the rogues, for the murder of Cyrus. This forces the warriors to spend the night navigating subways to get home as a manhunt is underway by all the gangs in the city. The movie was filmed entirely on location in New York and casted native New Yorkers for the roles. Naturally, filming in a city where crime was running rampant, they encountered run-ins with actual gangs, some of which would try to fight the actors and film crew due to the nature of the material. Even with the New York police gang unit at their aid, the actors were forbidden to wear their colors in certain areas. Adding to the caveat of challenges, the movie received enormous amounts of backlash due to the controversy it caused after release. Violence by street gangs has inspired a new movie, and the movie called The Warriors may be inspiring even more violence. Paramount Pictures has asked the 670 theaters showing The Warriors to put on extra security. Paramount Pictures says the incidents of violence associated with the film are really isolated cases. Theaters in the Bronx and Queen showing the film said they've had a number of problems. And in California, two theaters have stopped showing the film after an 18-year-old was stabbed to death and a 19-year-old was shot and critically wounded. Sandy Pearl, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. Sound familiar? Yeah, sounds like Rockstar made it. Violence would ensue during screenings because of the cocktail of gangs rendezvousing at theaters to see the film. Multiple shootings would result in the marketing being pulled to no effect, so the obligation for theaters to show the movie was abruptly cut short. The premature pulling of the film's marketing and showings led to a rival movie, The Wanderers, outselling The Warriors by around $500,000, and we wouldn't see a crimson vest from the streets of Coney Island again for over 20 years. If you're wondering why the game is also considered a cult classic, let's take a look at what the game was up against in 2005 and it released later in the year in October. Resident Evil 4, The Punisher, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, Gran Turismo 4, which is number 3 PS2 games of all time, Fight Night Round 2, Devil May Cry 3, God of War, Midnight Club 3 Double Edition, which is also a Rockstar game, Pokemon Emerald, which is number 3 for Game Boy Advance games, Destroy All Humans, which got a remaster before the Warriors, Utter, Disrespect, Flat Out, Underrated Game, and Series, Madden 06, Dogs, Rest in Peace, The Incredible Hulk, Ultimate Destruction, Burnout Revenge, Mortal Kombat, Shaolin Monks, Great Game, Ninja Guy in Black, the best of the series, the Grand Theft Auto trilogy for Xbox, which is the definitive GTA trilogy, Fear, Shadow of the Colossus, Guitar Hero, Condemned, WWE, SmackDown vs. Raw 2006, Need for Speed, Most Wanted, 50 Cent, Bulletproof, and Kingdom Hearts 2, which is top 15 games on the PS2. Yeah, this game didn't stand a chance, man. Rockstar wasn't the only one with the idea of releasing gold in the early 2000s, and the standards of the GTA series would not be met. To put it in perspective, GTA San Andreas made $235 million in the first week and sold over 12 million copies by March of 2005, way before the Warriors even came out. So $37 million worldwide compared to $235 million in the first week. In Rockstar's eyes, yeah, that might be a financial failure. 
A planned sequel was cancelled and Paramount published a weird Xbox Live Arcade spinoff similar to Armies of the Night, which would definitely talk about. But even with the less than stellar sales and living in the shadow of Grand Theft Auto, that wouldn't stop the Warriors from becoming a cult classic to gamers. The Warriors released on PS2, Xbox, and PSP, all of which I played for this retrospective, with PCSX2 gameplay included because the PS5 version looked like ass. But for some reason it works fine on the PS4, backwards compatibility, not really. The Xbox version is the definitive way to play if you prefer to play it in HD or if you can't emulate it. But if you plan on using the block button then go for the PS2 version. The PSP version should be avoided at all costs. Only because of the loading times of today's hardware, it'll kind of ruin the experience unless you have patience or if you just prefer to play it on the PSP. Before the events of the movie play out, we'll be making a reputation for ourselves three months prior to everything unfolding, playing through a prequel to the events of the movie that takes us on a journey delving into the Warriors' run-ins with local gangs, and also learning about the history of how they came to be during flashbacks. Virgil, leader of the Destroyers, a gang not originally in the movie, but closely resembling the Colonial Lords, the main rival gang from the book, is overcome by his power-hungry paranoia and sends Cleon and Vermin to a drug deal with the Satan's mothers that turns out to be a setup, effectively inspiring Cleon to form the warriors out of spite. You don't think I see you, Cleon? You don't think I know you trying to make moves behind my back? Trying to muscle me out of the way? You paranoid fuck! You just started a war! And I'm gonna be the last motherfucker you see before it's over! <laughs> you crazy, man! You and what fucking army? You go to see, You go to see. Swan and Cowboy play some King of the Hill and wreck the Destroyer's turf before running them out of their own headquarters and making it the Warrior's hangout. Ajax spends his first night as a warrior subdued by his temptations and coaxes Snow to tag along only to get ambushed and forced to hunt down the Destroyer's responsible for stealing their colors. After retrieving their vests, Ajax spends some quality time with a nice lady, probably in there doing some plumbing. A flock of destroyers chase you on your way out, and I'm pretty sure they infinitely spawn. I spent a good 10 to 20 minutes fighting them just to see if they would eventually stop spawning to the point I had to put in some cheats because I got stuck in this garage fighting the camera, which you will do that quite often. They didn't stop spawning by the way, so there's that. Cochise earns his vest slapping pimps in Harlem. <laughs> Taking a much needed detour. I'm a oh, then this goes with Mac from Predator. Furman's loudmouth talks him into tagging along with Fox to instigate the Savage Huns by wearing shirts that say F you Huns as they start wars in Chinatown to steal a ledger. Playing through these flashbacks reinforces the bond they have in the movie, and the believability makes it more of an extension rather than an imagining. Cleon's traditional, almost naive personality betrays himself in a way. He can tell there's conflict brewing between him and Virgil but he remains subservient without retaliation until he has no choice. Swan proving his worth by playing King of the Hill is a foreshadowing of his role to come. We can assume climbing here symbolizes his rise to be war chief, and his white shirt portrays his untarnished innocence fit for a level-headed leader. Ajax is impulsive and he lacks composure. His selfishness puts him and Snow in danger. If he can't lead one man, how can he lead an army? Character building in most games is subject to dialogue. Whereas here, we are reliving the moments that they experienced. We are growing with them as we play through the story, enriching our relationship with them on a personal level, gaining a perspective on their tendencies and personality. It's immersive. You can easily mistake the game for being the inspiration for the film. And I don't mean that to discredit the book or film, all of them amalgamate to a trifecta of complementary material rarely seen in media. Off the top, I can't think of a book worth its salt converted into a movie that garnered enough praise to become a game that is both timeless and contradicts the stigma of its genre. Gangs and their mannerisms are extrapolated with environments and stereotypes fitting for the hyperbolic nature of their caricature. Walking through hurricane territory as Spanish music fills the air like a Saturday morning submerges you into the atmosphere. Fedora brims, crowded stoops, and creased khakis make it feel lived in, but deadly. The hijinks of the hi-hats emphasizes the amusing yet diabolical side of an insane clown posse. Making our way through a killer amusement park is a thing of nightmares. Of course this would be their hideout. They're clowns. Each encounter with a gang during the story ends with a mini boss fight. Most of them are brawlic behemoths that tower over you, 
and the rest are either fodder or spamming gods. Boss fights, while unique and frenzied, do get repetitive though, and that's mainly due to the clumsy throwing sections where you'll have to hit the boss with projectiles while avoiding accidentally aiming at a friend while also dodging. Aiming the arch isn't hard until you have to constantly reset it in the heat of battle. It's annoying at its worst and tolerable at its best. Obviously, someone liked it. <clears throat> After building rep around town and causing mischief, the businesses of Coney Island fork up some cash for protection. And just like clockwork, the destroyers swarm your turf to, well, destroy. And you'll have to run back and forth to prevent them from destroying the local stores. When the dust settles, the score must be as well. The favors returned in rival turf as the warriors wreak havoc in Virgil's neighborhood and put an end to the feud. You have nothing before me. Nothing. Open your eyes, motherfucker. You ain't nothing but ashes. I love the irony in this mission. What was once being destroyed by you is now yours to protect, especially with Cyrus's speech in mind. The lines dividing turf are merely limitations of potential. These moments add an element of importance and meaning. Usually, games have sprawling open worlds full of foliage and vast horizons that in the grand scheme of things amounts to just eye candy. But Rockstar found ways to give this little piece of turf a purpose. This philosophy is explored more during the bonus objectives you can complete around Coney Island. And whether that's helping the local hobos, recruiting people to help with missions, You're marching with me now. or weeding out crooked dealers. Well, thanks, man, really. Two seconds later. Your turf is more than a hub, and a sense of ownership is developed over the course of the game's end. The lack of things to do after all the objectives are finished does show the game's age comparatively to modern day games, but that's a fault of the hardware limitations of that time, not the game. For a PS2 game, the immense attention to detail is on display. Cops are on patrol and any crimes you commit can be reported by civilians, unless you persuade them otherwise. Radios can be stolen from cars by rotating the analog sticks to remove screws, a feature Rockstar repurposed for Chinatown Wars. Funny thing is, you can also re-screw it back together. Locks can be picked to loot stores. There's a mugging minigame where you have to use the analog to find the vibration, which just sounds weird to say. Funnily enough, mugging yields different results depending on who you mug. For instance, homeless are easier to mug but only carry pocket chains, whereas dealers are harder to mug because they've probably seen a thing or two. You trying to get yourself killed? Two seconds later. Territory can be tagged throughout each borough, which uses a creative yet annoying mechanic. You have to actually use the analog to draw the shape. Some of them are more straightforward and some of them are more unique. Even with the best character in terms of laying down a burner, the annoying buzz when you spray too far outside the line will be burned into your memory. I found it easier to say fuck it and spray as fast as possible and somehow that's the best method. It's such an aggravating mechanic that there's a dedicated mission to spray multiple trains while fighting off gangs and swarms of cops at the same time. <laughs> Which cops, by the way, are either the easiest to fight off or are tackling you to the ground as soon as you stand up. Luckily, if they try to arrest you, you can resist by moving the analog to avoid the vibration or waiting for a fellow warrior to uncuff you. In the unfortunate event that your friends have been arrested, uncuffing them is as simple as alternating the triggers to bust them out. Every warrior is specialized in a specific category too. Ajax is stronger, he's basically the muscle of the group so he's better at doing things like mugging and resisting arrest but he's worse at finessing, so tagging, uncuffing people, lockpicking, and stealing is not his thing. Rembrandt being the new blood, he's more nimble, so he's better at things like tagging, uncuffing, lockpicking, but obviously he's not gonna beat anybody's ass, and he's not gonna mug anybody. As war chief, you are granted ghost recon -esque commands, commanding your gang to spread out to evade police, destroy cars to cause mayhem, follow you, wreck everyone, stay put or watch your back. I rarely use these outside of the mandatory parts during the missions, but telling them to stay put is helpful when they won't get out the fucking way. Quit that shit, man. Hold it. 
Hold it. Co-op prevents some of these issues. At any time during the game, a second player can join. And if you guys split too far apart, the camera splits as well, similar to what we've seen with the Lego series. Back then, I thought this was groundbreaking, but I really haven't seen it used outside of the Lego series. So obviously it's working in some fashion. There's an astonishing depth to the atmosphere. Wailing sirens become a nightmarish lullaby, a melody of mischief. It blends with the darkness, almost unnoticeable. You can hear snoring from the sleeping homeless and locals berating you as you commit crimes in their neighborhood. Riots paint a vivid picture of the ruthlessness of the untamed New York City of the 70s. Cops patrol the streets to quell the madness. We aren't the only ones at war. There is a world beyond Coney Island flourishing unbothered by our presence. Rockstar eloquently presents it a city in a state of emergency, and it gets more hectic after the meeting goes awry. After playing through about 70% of the game's prequel, the game becomes what salty fanboys call a playable movie. Nearly every encounter of the movie is replicated one to one with gameplay moments from the movie dramatized in a way that adds a layer of suspense and intensity. A director's cut, if you will. Sneaking through Turnbull AC territory is reminiscent of hiding from the thugs of Manhunt, and you feel like you're being hunted by Project Satan as the bus chases you to the subway, frantically leaping over fences and charging through boxes as the hum of the engine roars at your back. I could see this and many of the other parts of gameplay similar to it being turned into an endless runner, which I'm not trying to give them any ideas, but you get the point. We don't see much interaction from the warriors and the orphans in the movie, but Rockstar fleshed out their screen time with obvious jabs at their rep. For one, the territory is rife with police because we know they're chicken. Two, even though they are heavy in numbers, they're weak as fuck. And their allies, the Electric Eliminators, put up more of a fight. And three, by far, my favorite part of the movie and game is the Furies. I distinctly remember this scene as being euphoric and eerie. Nothing can be heard but panting and clatter from the shoes marching. They're as quiet as the night and as stiff as the bats they wield. The scene with the baseball bat being extended like a blade is something I always do when I hold a bat. I'll shove that bat up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. The chase scenes amplify the suspense too. Where did all those unique bits of gameplay go? The negative connotation behind button prompts is overblown. These could be cutscenes, but here it's used properly. I found myself anxiously smashing the X button or squeezing the sprint trigger pretending I'm running faster. I know it doesn't work like that, but it's still fun. It's like being scared with your friends versus by yourself. You get like hype scared, you know, it's exciting. I feel like the running with the Lizzie's though has some untapped potential. You really can't do much at the party besides chat with everyone until all the dialogue has been exhausted. So. It's not as memorable as the other encounters. Even the brief ambush you have with the punks is more engaging. Sure, you don't do much but wait to burst out of the stalls, but it's more dynamic than talking to NPCs just to complete a checklist. Fun fact, by the way, this scene was actually built from scratch for the movie because the subway didn't have a restroom at the time. Just when you make it home, the rogues are waiting for your arrival. A palpitating chime lurks in the distance as Luther taunts the warriors. It's time to put an end to the madness and deliver justice. But of course it wouldn't be an honorable fight. So we have to avoid being shot down during yet another peekaboo tossing waiting game. You can simply wait for his last shot to run up and throw a bottle at him or do it the hard way by manually aiming each time. After dealing with Luther, the rifts show up. Just before this, someone that witnessed the shooting came forward to reveal the truth. So we're safe to walk off in the sunset as the rifts deal with the rogues. If you wait long enough, you can actually play as the rifts as the credits roll. The later releases for the Warriors couldn't get the full soundtrack for the game, so the PS3, PS4, and PS5 version don't have the original song. 
In the City by the Eagles for the end credits, which is a dope song. Rockstar, you got billions of dollars off of GTA. Why, why can't you just pay for these soundtracks, man? Brawling is by far the best aspect of this game. Experienced fans of Rockstar games will notice the familiarity of the gameplay. The arcade style fighting takes heavy inspiration from Rockstar's earlier titles like State of Emergency, Manhunt, and even the GTA series. It's as if these games bang to make this gang game. Gang bang? Nicky Jakey? You can see the similarities with State of Emergency's fast paced, almost Arkham esque style fighting and ability to chain combos. Each character has two specific grappling finishers with a crowd clearing special. And you can also do a Vanquish style running attack. They seemingly repurposed the kill cam and manhunt for the special finishers and the warriors. I can't say the same for the gruesomeness though. Obviously we can draw similarities between the stealth scenes and the gangs of manhunt. Enemies will taunt you as you lurk in the shadows. I know there's someone over here, just show yourself! RPG elements from San Andreas were added too. After each mission, you can work out to increase your stats by doing push-ups, sit-ups, chin-ups, and hitting the heavy bag. And it looks like they may have had a speed bag at one time. Maybe it was cut content or just for atmosphere. I really wish they would bring these mini games back. As far as the combat goes, you have light and heavy attacks along with grappling, ground, tandem, and running attacks. Basic attacks yield about 10 combinations, give or take. If you add in the snapbacks, it's probably a little more. And pressing light and heavy at the same time unleashes a heavier push or knockdown attack. Pressing O or B will grab someone. Holding it will tackle them to the ground. Pressing X and O together will do a heavier grab and pressing grab while holding someone will slam them to the ground. Tossing an opponent to the ground can open up multiple methods of punishment from stomping, stabbing, slamming their head in the ground, or giving them a helping of nucky sandwiches. Bottles and bricks can either be thrown or used to pummel someone's face, giving you some good old Last of Us vibes. Leaping or charging into crowds of boppers can disrupt swarms, which is satisfying to spam just to see your body flying like the Hardy Boys. I figured out how to do an absurd flying squirrel type of move, jumping off of ledges and I'm pretty sure that's a glitch or something. Yeah, nonetheless, it was fun. You rack up style points based on how you connect combos or how you cause mayhem. It'll build up your rage meter. It's a brief moment of invincibility with a stronger set of attacks, basically Kratos in the hood. Each warrior has unique special moves fit for their fighting style. Finishers follow the philosophy of using slow motion during fighting scenes from Walter Hill by using it sparingly. And just as in the movie, Rockstar applied it to the last move you execute to emphasize its impact. Tandem attacks can be activated if you grab someone while an enemy is in a chokehold, which can also happen to you too. Slugging it out is easy, but if you find yourself struggling, snorting some coke, I mean, using flash can heal you or blocking like a the PS2 has block mapped to R1 while the Xbox version has it mapped to the black button. And the PSP uses down on the directional pad, which is weird, making the PS2 the superior in terms of gameplay or PCSX2. If you hold the block button long enough, you'll duck on the last hit, allowing you to counter it, which I didn't know as a kid until now, but I mean, I never blocked anyway because it was a brawler. It somewhat ruins the overall pacing of the brawls. Grabs can also be countered by hitting someone at the right time or pressing block as they grab you. In the unfortunate event you're locked in a hold, you can kick out of the double team or throw them over your shoulder. It's simple, but more complex than any release from Rockstar, unless GTA 6 improves on the melee from Red Dead 2, which wasn't even that great. The closest thing to it in modern terms would be Sleeping Dogs or Sifu, although Sifu is more focused on moment-to-moment -moment interactions rather than a clusterfuck of knuckles. A clusterfuckles? Cluster knuck? I don't know. Of course, there's also weapons such as bats, 2x4s, and pool balls. And it wouldn't be a Rockstar game without outlandish weapons like skulls, foam fingers, and steak. Overall, it's condensed, but varied, and it escalates in multiplayer mode. Welcome to 2005, when multiplayer was complete on day one. <clears throat> when you want to enjoy some good old couch co-op, 
for the Fortnite kids, that's when you sit next to a person and play games together for free. But I mean, you can still spend hours alone playing the various modes. 1v1 is perfect for practicing moves or challenging a friend, while more chaotic modes like War Party can be used to recreate scenes from the movie. My favorite of these is Battle Royale, which is not the Battle Royale you guys know. It's all of the fun of tossing someone out of the ring like the old No Mercy and Smackdown games, and it's a 300 simulator. This is Sparta! All gangs can be selected if you've completed all objectives in story mode, and unique gangs like movie extras and... Bob? Bob's Burgers? The coolest part about being able to play is virtually every NPC you encounter during the game is the ability to choose the war chief. Wanna be Chatterbox and lead the hi-hats? Go ahead. Wanna be the one and only Cyrus or one of the mini-bosses? Done. You can play as anyone you choose or start your own custom game. Rumble mode is almost a game in and of itself. The tremendous amount of content would be a shocker for anyone who didn't experience the PS2 and Xbox. We had it made before slivers of content were pre-planned to be DLC or stretched out in season passes. And guess what? There's more. Once you finish the story, you can unlock a double dragon inspired beat em up called Armies of the Night. I personally grew up on Streets of Rage, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Simpsons, and Battletoads in terms of similar style games, so for the fans of the old school, don't come for me. I honestly never played this part of the game growing up because I spent too much time playing the rumble mode. Plus, as stated in the beginning of the video, 2005 had a lineup like no other in terms of great games. I did enjoy completing it for the retrospective. The difficulty can be curbed by using the block button or spamming the jab. So if you're looking for a challenge in terms of beat em ups, I'd stick to the usual classics. There should have been some train scenarios or chasing levels, something to spice up the gameplay. It's pretty bare bones. Props to Rockstar though for delivering one of, if not the best movie licensed game to date. Recreating the atmosphere of the movie with voice acting from most of the original cast after 20 something years. Capturing the same vigor and passion from their performances decades before, while also preserving their characters and newly written lines for a new story. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, the Warriors game is so well done that it is an equal to the book and movie, and is an extension if not part of them both. But not everything is so well done. In 2009, Paramount Pictures decided to publish an Xbox Live Arcade version of the Warriors. Don't know why. They missed the train by about four years. <laughs> I'm guessing they saw potential in Rockstar's Armies of the Night and attempted to capitalize on the success of the 360 and Xbox Live's popularity. I regret scouring the internet to find this in English just to play it for the video because the gameplay is clunky and uninteresting. I didn't know this existed until this year. <laughs> yeah, don't even bother with this game. It's not available to purchase and if you do find it, it's in Russian. The Warriors is a perfect storm. One prolific and proven developer in their heyday turns a classic film into a game and it shatters expectations. The bittersweet part of it is that it's a timeless gem that will either fade with the memory of those who played it growing up or Rockstar will tarnish its legacy with another terrible remaster. I only hope if it did receive a remake or remaster that it would be handled with care because it's one of Rockstar's most underrated titles. I understand the technological feats they accomplished with LA Noir, but that game is not in the same league as the Warriors and it got a remaster. If y'all wanna see more retrospectives, like and share the video, and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching. This is what we fought all night to get back to. Come on, let's go.